Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome. I am your host, Bilal Khan. I am here with Sheikh Kamal al Mekki. We are coming at you from Space City, aka Houston, down the road from NASA, over here at the Clear Lake Islamic Center, aka the Click, where old people go to die. So, which is a, a boondock spot of uh, Houston. Essentially, if you come out here, just keep your eyes open for gators and lizards and cockroaches. And that was the case, right? When you lived here, is that what? Yeah, that was, I, I, that was I, I your speak, experience. I speak with yes authority because yeah. I've been here for two years. Yeah, and then <laughs> once you left, and I came, and all the fun people came, and it changed yeah, completely. Right? Believe it or not. <laughs> anyway, so we just literally spent the last five days producing two seminars back to back. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Seminar number one, the story of Yajuj and Majuj. And seminar number two being the tafsir of Surat Nur. And uh, all 64 verses, we literally finished like less than an hour ago. Yes. Long, <laughs> as, grueling as week. Quick uh, showcase to everybody what we're looking at right here. Yeah. So we've got Sheikh right here, right? And then we got camera, got camera, camera, camera. And then we got camera, I got this big light, V-flat lighting us over here. Got another couple of lights in the background, nice big black background. We were, we've we basically uh, been in this location for the last uh, week or so. And so let, let's get to know you a little bit, right? For those of you who are unacquainted, although he's been teaching with Al-Maghrib for a while, but for those of us who are unacquainted, uh, we, like we met, when? 2004? Is this the one at your house or is this the one before that? I can't remember. <laughs> On a professional level, we met in like 2015. No, 2013. Really? So we met before that, huh? Yeah. So when you taught your Tamil Shahada class. Oh, in New York or in, New uh, Jersey? In New Jersey. Montclair State, New Ooh. Jersey. I think before that, you taught it in Central Jersey. Yes, I did. Yeah, I think that, that was the first it. one that I attended. Okay. Oh, wow. The one where... And M MCMC. Yeah, Mustafa Rahimullah. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, that was back in like 2004. It's funny, that's one of, you know, I've been teaching it for like 16 years, but I remember that one very well. I remember the room, I remember the... Yeah. And I remember that masjid had a weird rule, man. Isn't that the masjid where in, even in the bathroom stall, you were not allowed to put slippers on? You had to be in your socks? I don't remember that part. An... All I know is that they would yell at me for jumping off the, the stairs banister. Man, I told you. I and then they called the, the cops bathroom. on me thinking I was some weirdo. What? Uh, well, because I... I was, uh, it's not my community, right? So, uh, and they were kicking us out of the masjid. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and I was like, what, 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 like, what are you afraid of? You're going to break into the donation box or something? <laughs> they, they were ready to call the cops and Mustafa had to calm them down. Really? And he's like, look, I know this guy. I can vouch for him. He's a good dude. Uh, uh, and yeah. apparently, I didn't know this, that the masjid actually had a break-in. Uh, oh, okay. Right? And I just kind of said it in passing as a joke. And they didn't and they take it. it they didn't take it so seriously. <laughs> so yeah, I'm still <laughs> vouching for you. Like he went out on a limb, huh? Oh, he. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so that was the first time we met. Before we met, mm. uh, I was uh, uh, I got introduced to your Battle of Badr series. Oh, the good old like the very the yeah, beginning yeah, days. The beginning not even days. The good, yeah. Those were like yeah. The and Battle then uh, and then afterwards the fitness series. Battle of Uhud and the yeah. Fitna, you're right. The classes of yours that I have attended and the appreciation that I have for the knowledge that you have, uh, it's uh, it's one of the things that kind of uh, I appreciated as grueling as this last week was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as, there's always that benefit of like your background in da'wah. And I think my question for you initially was what got you into da'wah? Oh, nice. Okay, I started reading about it, right? Let me, I'll, I'll tell you what I started reading. But the rest, I got pushed into it. Okay. And, and I really like that. As like, I think it's the, it, for me personally, it's the most preferable way to get into speaking. And sure. like, I'll be honest with you, I can't stand when someone says, oh, this guy, um, his dream is to be a sheikh and he's studying to be a sheikh and a, le and a famous lecturer. Like, uh, so you're seeking the fame or, you know, anyways. So let's go like this. Um, it started... Uh, when I when I found a first copy of one of the, one of the books of Ahmed Didat Rahimahullah. Okay. So I read that book, and I'm like memorized it, right? Yeah. Got another one, memorized it, and then I got to the point where okay, and this was in Africa. Where my father was stationed there. Right. So I'm looking. So just, just uh, you're you're originally born. Were you born in Sudan? Yes. Okay. I was born in Sudan, but then right away I went like kindergarten was in Saudi Arabia, then. Elementary school was in Pakistan, and then finishing elementary in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Then middle school was in Zaire, 
and then okay, so you're global global citizen. Yes, my father was a diplomat, so we moved okay, everywhere. Okay, you know. So, so you're in Africa. I'm in Africa at this yeah. point. Where? And uh, this was in Sudan. Actually. In Sudan. Okay. Yeah. So we just came back from Zaire, back to well, what used to be Zaire. It doesn't exist anymore. Went to Sudan, and I I found some books of Ahmed Didat. I'm like, okay, and I I like want to use that da'wah with somebody, but people don't really speak English in Sudan. Right. All right? And I don't have a copy of the Bible, and you can't just go to the dollar store and get one for a buck. Okay. I remember it was a Filipino family. I told them I really want a copy of the Bible. And I went with them in their house, and they're looking for it. They open up this huge drawer full of old shoes, <laughs> and they're digging under these shoes, and I'm like, this is where you put your sacred book? Oh, no. And you're really looking under all... This would never happen. Like, in the right, Muslim, right, like someone right, looks right, under right. shoes for a like, Mus'haf here. No. Well, did they not have those King James versions of the Bibles up in all the hotels at this point? Oh, no, no. Okay. This is Sudan, man. What, okay, what? I got gotcha. you. Huh. And so, they wouldn't have that in, the, in their hotels. Like, they don't have a Quran in their hotel, <laughs> right? So okay. I, I got a copy. I'll make the story shorter. Anyways, yeah. I got a copy. I started reading it. I had my little index marks, markings and memorized it. So then I was like, then, uh, then we moved to the U.S., all right? And I said, this is going to be great. I'm going to be talking with, I'm speaking to people who are, you know, well-versed in the Bible. We're going to have intellectual discussions. And of course... Well, that's the assumption that the people yes. in the U.S. know the Bible. Yes. And it's so unfair to think that. And it's also unfair to think that the majority of people are intellectual. And right. So I came... Similarly, how it's uh, unfair to think that Muslims know the Quran. Exactly. You know, I feel like everyone's a hafiz <laughs> and can tell you, break down a tafsir. And... Yeah. So... Speaking of which, I think uh, it's easy to say... Uh, and this is a study done by one of our own instructors mm -hmm. where, with uh, Sam Sharif, who run the Quran Revolution. Uh -huh. he, uh, uh, he would speak and ask people, you know, rooms of hundreds, if not thousands, how many of you read the Quran cover to cover? And every gathering, it was like maybe a handful of people. No. Yeah. R really? Really. In, in a language they understand. That was the condition. Oh, okay. So right? not in, just in Arabic. Right. So you've gone through the Quran cover to cover in a language mm -hmm. you understand. And so, and he stopped doing it after like, I think the 16th time because it's just like the same result. Nothing changed and yeah. it's embarrassing on top and of so, it. But I mean, for me, I'm looking at it from a statistical analysis. I'm like, yo, this is good data. Yeah, and, very good actually. And, and so, and I think it also gives us a snapshot where Muslims here and Christians here with their knowledge of the yeah. book is a similar yeah, boat, absolutely. right? absolutely. So, so I was, but, but I was, I've got all this, let's just say, um, ars I've got this arsenal of material that I've memorized and I want to use it so badly that I, when I would find out someone didn't know anything about the Bible I would start to teach him about the Bible so I can use it again it just was not good okay anyways so but let then, me tell you what's in your book so that I can refute it <laughs> and, you, and you know what the gospels are okay so I can tell you so I can quote them all right so but something great that happened actually was I'm fast forwarding here uh -huh. I met some brothers every time I meet these brothers Oh, yeah, yesterday four guys took Shahada. Oh, yesterday five guys took Shahada. Yeah. The day before that, seven people took Shahada. We went to this university, gave da'wah there for a full day. Seventy people took Shahada. I'm like, what? Okay. I've been trying for years. Like, not a single... <laughs> not a single one. Mm. What's the technique? So, but the thing is, we literally gave them about a year to try to give us in steps, just enunciate. This is how you give da'wah. Okay. Like a process. Yeah. Okay. I had a, I had a radio show back then. It was every single day, every okay. single morning. And I'll give them the last 15 minutes of the episode well, to explain is, how to give that one. Speaking of the radio show, just a little tangent. Yeah. Like, I know you, I know your background is communications, yes. right? Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into that? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. You know, like things work in funny ways, right? Yeah. So basically... You studied it as, uh, as college, right? Yes. Okay. So like, a, you have a degree in it, bachelor's degree in that. In the beginning, I was studying, you know, business management, whatever. Sure. And, um, and it's boring and... It had too much math in it. And th the reason I'm complaining from math is not like I was dumb in math or anything, but practical and application. This, this is going to offend some people and okay. make some people happy. Okay. But I was studying. So remember when I, we, I said we left Zaire and it's not yeah. called Zaire anymore? Sure. Basically, the army came out and started attacking foreigners and destroyed the country. In Zaire? Yes. Oh, wow. So we left on a military plane. Kind of like an emergency situation. Yeah. And I left. And you're not even from Zaire, so it's no. more precarious. My, yeah, my dad was the ambassador there. We left. And then I had done two years of uh, studying in an American school. And when I got there, I, I had to study in the British system. Okay. Which 
I really don't like praising British things. Okay. But it's far more advanced. The math is far harder. Well, the yeah. science is harder. I, I think you could say that about any country in oh, regards to the uh, American education yes, system. Yes, that is sad. <laughs> so, so I could never, I was two years behind on math. Oh. I could never catch up. Okay. So they were doing, you know, it's not that hard now, but they were doing, you know, what calculus that called thing, calculus yeah. and all that stuff. So I was really, I mean, I was behind and, and it was creating issues for me with my degree. Right. I said, you know, what? I'm going to change this degree. I was really interested in philosophy. That's because one of our teachers, Sheikh Jafar, and he's, Sheikh he's Jafar superb. Yeah, Sheikh Jafar Adris, okay. and he's just one of the last living, like true philosophers for as far as Muslim scholars. Then I was also interested in history, and I said, okay, I'll change my de degree to history. Oh, but then okay. I don't want to become that guy who has a history degree. You know that joke? What did the history major say to the math major? Would you like fries with that? <laughs> because the history is just working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, al al unless you're publishing, uh, then uh, becomes... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know, like, even in my case, like, I started off in business management. Not business, I started off in economics with a oh, minor in business management. Really? I thought I was going to be a bond trader. Right? Really? That, 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 was, that, that was initially. But then uh, during my time in school, Lehman Brothers went under. Oh. Right? And I'm like, yo, this whole thing is very uh, mm. flimsy. Yeah. Right? And uh, kind of lost hope. I didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. So all my grades dropped. They kicked me out. And then uh, they told me I got to do better elsewhere, then come back. Mm. I did that. Actually ended up making the dean's list. Oh, you did? Huh? Yeah. And Good then uh, when I got back, I went part-time. Worked full-time. Paid for school. No school loans. And uh, did one to two uh, classes a semester. But in that time, I was exploring, should I go to this communication school? <laughs> should I go to film school? Uh, and then in the end, I, uh, I landed on business admin with marketing. Nice. And then I also went to the film school's dean. I'm like, can I take all your classes for free without credit? Oh. And they're like, yeah. And so in a seven and a half years, I went through the curriculum twice over. Because I was doing working full time, school part time, and then free time was film school. Well, that's good to know. So you're not just making this stuff up. You just <laughs> studied it. I, I got to tell you a funny yeah. story about the dean's list, right? Yeah. So I wasn't taking school seriously, but I was on the dean's list. Sure. I had a very high uh, grade point average, and instead of my mom being happy, she was upset that <laughs> she was upset at what? She was upset that I was on the dean's list. She would always say it. She would be like, "How are you on the dean's list?" You never study. You're running around <laughs> all the time. This makes no sense. I'm like, it's like you don't deserve to be on the exactly. Okay. That's exactly how it was. Okay. But I mean, slightly in a funny way. You know, yeah. we had that relation. We still have that relation. Alhamdulillah. With my right. Mom. But so you landed on communications. Yes. Okay. Um, it's interesting. Part of it was just to avoid math. This was a degree where there's no math in it. Okay. Okay. And and then the other part. Here's how it happened. I started working at this. Uh, this was the first full-time Islamic radio station in North America. It's, okay. Okay. And we, it was to span like throughout, through the five different states. Sure. And at a given moment, I had like 5,000 listeners on the show, which like if I give a lecture at a hall and 5,000 people show up, this will be like an incredible event. Right. But you don't see them, but they're out there with yeah, radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, exactly. So, and you kind of have an idea of who's listening. Yes. Okay. And at, this is at this point where I'd already learned street da'wah. Right. So I got into street da'wah and everything and, and was realizing the importance of da'wah. But we were like, spend hours passing out one pamphlet per person. And when I got the job at radio, I said, da'wah has to move to mass communication. Of course. It has to. And you know that more than anyone, like as far as radio and TV and cameras and all that Digital stuff. Media, Digital media, social media. media. And back then, of course, none, none of that none, existed. <laughs> none, and, and whatever we even, could not do this back then at all. Yeah. And whatever existed, the Muslims had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Right. So, I I, I started thinking Dawa has to move past one pamphlet, one person. And here I am on the radio show, and like I said, I would have from three to five thousand listeners anytime you click the button on yeah. the mic button. So I th I said, this is it. This is how you do it. And I just switched my major. So it was a combination of that job right, right, and, right. and no math. And I switched my major to communication. Double motivation. I'll tell you something. For sure, yeah. But I'll tell you something. I mean, if someone, without any exaggeration, the field of communications is pure da'wah. You study interpersonal communication, da'wah. Intercultural communication, da'wah. Giving speeches, PRs, pure da'wah. Marketing, the theory behind radio, the theory behind television, and how much do they affect, do they affect. Yeah. I mean, it was just... Uh, rhetorical journalism. criticism. Oh my goodness, yeah. journalism. It was just, I'm getting trained in da'wah for three, four years, you know. 
So when I say black belt, I mean, I really mean it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's true. I mean, you know what's interesting in, in, in the field of martial arts? Yeah. Right? You, it's, it, a black belt, generally speaking, is not a master. No. Right? A, a, yeah. a black, you're not, in fact, you're not even necessarily qualified to teach as a yeah. black belt. As a black belt, you might be considered an older brother, a senpai. Yeah. Once you get your third degree or third dan, then you achieve the rank of sensei. But yeah. here's the thing. It might take you four to five years to earn a black belt. It takes an additional four to five years to get to third dan. Exactly. Right? I mean, we used to do taekwondo, right? And we were, I mean, training to, to get the, the black belt, sure. right? Which is the red belt in taekwondo. But, but the thing is that when you look up just the dictionary definition, it basically in martial arts, you get the basics from your instructor. What you're supposed to do is come up with your own like kind of style sure, and what have you. Sure. But uh, we used to see black belts who basically just memorize the katas, the steps. Oh, and right, that's right. all. Yeah, they they yeah. can't fight. It doesn't mean you know how to fight. Remember in the 70s, you had to register if you're a black belt? What's interesting in the 70s, they actually um, banned, I think, across the U.S., um, starting with California, nunchucks. They did. Yeah. Even just recently in New York City, did mm -hmm. they unban it. The problem really? was people watching Bruce Lee movies and, and every other gangster had a nunchucks on and them. And then cracking each other's skulls. <laughs> so essentially, your background is da'wah. You got yeah. the, the black belt of da'wah. And, and just so we're yeah. clear, I never said that about myself. No, other people just, did. That's good, though. Because that's, that's PR right there, what other people say about you yeah, when you're yeah, not there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which, is, which is a wonderful thing, a good reputation. Now, here, here's the thing. I think I feel like a lot of uh, immigrant minded individuals is that the right thing mm -hmm. so you've probably heard this among, i know amongst the desi community and even amongst the arab community uh and generally amongst immigrants there's this whole idea of what will other people say oh, yeah. huh? right i like that and meaning what will other people say mm. however from a mass communication standpoint yes you need to understand and you need to be aware of your reputation Mm -hmm. Right. And this is something that you touch upon heavily in uh, in the uh, Tafsir Sultan Nur class. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, and but I think there's it's a question of like, how do you find that balance between the idea of like, look, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care what anybody says. Mm -hmm. I got to do what I got to do versus, you know, I got a reputation to manage. Yeah. Um. I mean, honestly, I'm not going to play games with you. That That is a tough question, right? It needs a more contemplation. Yeah. But maybe it's enough to say that with issues of religion, maybe, yeah, I need to right. put like more guidelines in there. Because but, the, the reason I'm asking this uh -huh. question, because it was a thought that I had when we were doing our recordings. And because you were mentioning how even in the case of Aisha, mm -hmm. she could have just been like, look, I don't care what anybody says. Exactly. Right. But Allah was, knows the truth. Who cares right. what you think? Exactly. Right. And I would, I would have thought like, yeah, that's the right attitude to have, but that's not the attitude it's she not. had. Yeah. And so, uh, is, is it is it a question of deen versus dunya? Uh, it matters. Let's put it this way: like with issues of deen, so so your reputation, your your deen is something that is so valuable to you. Mm. Yeah. Just like nobody would go out and say, <clears throat> you know. Like I'm a Zani, or you know, or I, <laughs> well, I skip in today's day and age. Ah, uh, uh, today's day. Let's like let's they, they, use they're, normal. They're not. They're now. not. They're not going to use mm. those sa that same terminology. Exactly. exactly. But they'll be flaunting. You know, uh, especially from guys' perspective. Yeah. They. They. they you know. They. They congrat. There, there's a cultural congratulations amongst dudes who kind of get around. I don't even know what example to use. Like I would say, like if you got an F, you'd be ashamed, you'd hide it. But even today, oh, I got an F, they post it. You know, I don't know what to... Getting fired. Huh? Yeah, if you got fired. Yeah. You, you, even if you posted it, about it, yeah. it'll be to get pity and, and sympathy, not really because you're proud of the fact that you Unless you're starting a business. Yeah. Unless it's like, oh, I got fired, now I can start that business. But I remember a friend of mine, he quit... Uh, <laughs> we were document imaging was the where we were working yeah and um he came to me he's like i got in the morning and I was, i'm his supervisor he's like i got another job i'm like really so you have your letter of resignation he goes uh-uh i got this he opens up this piece of paper there's a smiley face on it with a marker and it says happy scanning i quit and he says, I'm just going to scan that and it's going to stay up at lunch. It's going to stay up on the screen when I never come back and they come check my 
station. <laughs> they they gonna say, read like, that? And he did it, and it was oh, hilarious. No. It was very wrong, but hilarious. Talk about burning your bridges, huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then what's funny is like a year, a year later, I rehired him, but that's everyone else was fired, and everyone else left. Nobody knew how. Even happened. our boss's boss was fired. Oh wow! So okay. I rehired him actually. And then he burned me this time. Oh, no. That guy was so responsible. So he wouldn't advertise, I'm irresponsible. He was ashamed of that. Right, right. right. So, uh, and when something is like, like very embarrassing to you and something is dear to you, you wouldn't go out and, and soil your reputation in that regard. So nobody and everybody in, in, in the end, deep down, let's just say amongst the believers, you want to be uh, righteous, you know, be known for right, righteousness. Yeah. So nobody wants to say, yeah, you know, Amazani, believe Amazani. Like, it's very dear to you. Right. Why would I, would you want to believe that? Like you, for example. What's the word for that? Hmm? Um, your, uh, I mean, I, I know chastity is one uh, understanding, yeah. but it's just like your uh, honor. Yeah, your honor, your honor. Your yeah. I was thinking of Ard in Arabic. Like, for example, you, this is like, this is your thing. This is what you're known for, right? And you don't want. At least in the uh, Islamic uh, yeah. space. And, and you wouldn't accept or want anyone to, to try to say you don't know anything about what you're doing about this video work and stuff that would because that's something important to you and you right. wouldn't accept to be put down in that sense right? or be put in a situation where the best that i can produce is trash yeah absolutely so but when it comes to dunya stuff like so what if you said yeah i know this stuff like the back of my hand i can show you about three-point lighting blah 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 sure. and here it's a matter of dunya i'm not really because when you boast in religion you are basically, uh, Allah calls it lying against him. I think here, I think what you're alluding to, at least what I'm understanding, mm -hmm. is an issue of identity. It, it is, and you're free to market yourself, you know. Like, for example, I was telling you about the electric bikes that I have now. Yeah. I told you that I know them like the back of my hand. Like, you could take it apart, yeah. just mix up the screws. I don't even know where each screw goes. For anybody who doesn't understand, one of Sheikh Kamal's <laughs> newest hobbies is uh, salvaging Razor electric scooters. <laughs> Taking it apart, putting it back together, and maybe one day selling it. But and upgrading. I have to. You got to make it more powerful and faster, right? Right. right. So yeah. So you yeah. got you know like the back of your hand. But then if somebody were to like yo, you got you don't know what you're doing. So, but it, but what I'm saying is if I'm like marketing that, yeah. And there's also a benefit that comes to me from like for example the scholars say if I spend and an, not an extravagant but a, a, a good amount of money on my phone, mm. but just holding that phone in my hand makes a statement about me as a businessman sure. or as a person, then it's per it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that yeah. because it's going to bring you more, you know, revenue. It's more like getting business. a Rolex watch as a salesman. Yeah. If, if it really does, I mean, not just, it's an excuse to put one on, but if it really does bring some kind of, bring you more benefit or make you more um, I, I, think, I, I, I think it's the equivalent of maybe more appropriate example is dressing for the job. Yeah, absolutely. It is dressing for the job. And there's dressing for the job and dressing for the position higher than yours, right? Right, right, right. Dressing for what you want, yeah. right? Uh, it's funny because people talk about fake it till you make it, but as opposed to be what you want to be, yeah. right? Do you, Now, is there like a... Have you ever found it? Because I don't like the whole fake it till you make it, especially in the case of Dawah. And I, and I feel like a lot of people shy away yeah. from Dawah. They shy away from defending Islam. Yeah. Why? Because they see themselves not doing the basics that they feel yeah. like they feel like they have to be perfect. And it's such a wrong understanding. Yeah. It, and it's funny how these things which are like problems and obstacles today for du'at would've been answered like a thousand years ago. The scholar said there, there's never going to be a day when you wake up and your iman is strong and 100%. Okay, let me check my knowledge. It's 100%. They say if that day ever happens, You've gone astray. <laughs> so you just take what you have, what you can, and then you go out and you call people to Allah. And it's one of the old tricks of the shaitan. Yeah. You know, when it was me and Sheikh Muhammad Faqih, we were giving this lecture together. It was actually Texas Da'wah here in Houston many years ago before I moved here. Mm. And I was saying the shaitan, I told him, the sad thing is that the shaitan tricks us with old tricks. He doesn't like invent a new trick no one's ever heard of in, in humanity yeah. and get you with it. He's getting you with very old classical tricks. Mm. Classic. And then Sheikh uh, Hamad Faqir, when it was his turn, he says, you know, while well, you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, is the shaitan that smart? Or are we that dumb that he just gets us with the oldest tricks in the book? In Dawah, this is one of the oldest tricks in the book. You... You delay your salah. How can you go and call people out to Allah? Okay, that's exactly why I need to go call people to Allah. Yeah. Because calling to Allah increases my iman as well. You know, 
And then it helps me expiate for that bad deed. If this guy becomes Muslim, it covers up for my missing the salah yesterday, you know? It's like an old trick, but it still it's, works. It's funny because if you put it into logical terms, it's like, why should I go and earn more money when I have debts? Yeah. It's like, that's why you need to go earn more money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. You got your passion for da'wah. You got your communications training and discipline. But yet, you found yourself in the space of teaching. Yes. Right? Now, one thought that comes to mind, and, and I know this, because I remember you mentioning one time when you were preparing your uh, series for Fitna. Yes. Which, for anyone who doesn't know, right? And, and this is just my own uh, experience with the content. So one of the first Maghrib classes, actually the first Maghrib class that I ever took was mm -hmm. Conquest, History of the Khulafa. Oh, okay. Right? History of Khulafa Rashidin, taught by Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif. Right? The, the brilliant, I guess, presentation structure mm -hmm. was that it told a singular story it was or through the eyes of... Essentially through the eyes yeah. of Abdullah bin Zubair. Yeah. Right? A Sahabi, one of the, fir the first male companion to be born in Medina. Right? All the way up until when Al-Hassan bin Ali surrendered the army to Muawiyah. Mm. Right? And uniting the Muslim Ummah. Didn't stop there, huh? That, that's where they ended the story. They wanted to end it on a good note. Okay. Right? And, and, and that is the end of the Khulafa Rashidin. Right? And then, when I picked up your fitness series, it was like a flashback going back to the story of uh, before the fitna of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu yeah. and, and leading all the way up until the assassination of Abdullah bin Zubair. Right? And yeah. so now the thing is, there was a lot of information. In fact, the fitna series I felt like was more detailed than the history of Khulfa Rashidin, which was... Now, later when I asked, uh, we, I think this is one time I was at your place for... Uh, barbecue uh, in Virginia for steaks. Yeah, uh, and uh, and and you were mentioning how you would go from like Fajr to Maghrib every day or something like that. Uh, from no, from something like from Isha to Fajr. I oh, work the at opposite way. Yeah, okay, because my phone doesn't ring at that time. It was very quiet. But I got to add something though. Yeah. At that at that time, this was like a year where I had stopped eating meat like completely. Okay. And I look. I love meat. I'm pro meat. Okay. All right. But I gotta say this. Uh, even though I don't, I don't like promoting anything that's anti meat. Sure. As a matter of fact, if I ever go to dinner with someone and it turns out they're a vegetarian and I ask them why, and they say, "Well, because you know we decrease meat con meat consumption," then I order two steaks so I cancel out his life decision. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you something. Yeah. That year. Was it a deliberate choice? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and it was actually due to misunderstanding a fiqh issue. Oh, uh, okay. Even though I consulted Sheikh Walid about it, and I pushed him so much that he went and consulted Sheikh Salah Hassan about it. Basically, I'd done a lot of research on how we're moving away from the topic. No, this is good. So, the topic is you right now. <laughs> so I had done a, little, a lot of research on um, cattle feed. Okay. And I got a lot of books. Back when, when Amazon, you'd get like books for 40, 50 when cents. When Amazon was books. the largest bookstore in the world. And that's yes. what they sold. And only that's the only thing that's they sold. That's the only thing they sold. Yeah. So I bought, I would buy these books for 40 cents, 50 cents, 60 cents. I got a whole bunch about cattle feed, how it's produced, what's in it. And there's just no way around it. Like they put leftovers of other animals in sure, this. Sure, sure. Now in, in Islam, any, like a cow or any animal that consumes uh, in the, Impurity, yeah, it's known as al jalala. You're not really even supposed to touch it okay. because it's you know, even its sweat is uh, impure, right, right? Right, you're supposed right. to quarantine it until it eats you know, nothing but grass, what have you, until the whole so system's like, been flushed out. I know these are nothing but a bunch of jalalas over here, <laughs> so and I got, we're not even talking about corn fed cows, no, no, okay. no. I got so turned off that I, I'm not eating meat, so and I'm not even the bi hamid either because yeah. because. The, it's, it's the same story. It's still come, yeah, yeah. It's just slaughtered halal, but it still comes from these places. So when you say you're not eating meat, does that include fish and chicken? No, so and goat and so no, no, no. Okay. I, I ate fish uh, only. What is that called? It's called a seafood diet. There's that you seafood you eat it. <laughs> well, in this case, it's literally a seafood diet, right? So what happens when you when you quit meat? I don't care what anybody says. First of all, the amount of energy that you have is just unbelievable. Sure. And so when I did the fitness series, I stayed up probably for three months from Isha to Fajr okay. without any coffee, any like I could on command and on demand. If I just want to stay up, like if I say I'm staying up from now until 11 in the morning tomorrow, right. boom, I just do it just like that without one yawn. Energy was unbelievable. My memory was unbelievable. 
focus. I've never had better focus in my life. And I'm, until I'm sure now, with Sam would agree with everything you're saying. He doesn't need me. Well, it's not that he doesn't. He like he's kind of in your boat too. He loves that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, but because he has you know health complications himself personally. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't and, know that. Uh, but uh, but the thing is, when he went on a vegetarian type of diet just to kind of help with his stuff, his energy went up. His only challenge, really, mm -hmm. because he's uh, already a naturally lanky guy, mm -hmm. uh, it's like for him to put on weight and get the appropriate protein consumption oh. was very... Uh, and it was a challenge already. Uh, without, yeah, it was uh, already a challenge. Yeah, I see. So, how, I mean, what? Did, but in your case, it was more about that energy and focus. Yeah. Okay. It was incredible. So, so it really came at the right time, helped me do that whole series. So, literally for three months... I guess so. I mean, it's okay. been so long. It's It's been over 16, what? Yeah. Something like 16 years <laughs> Six, ago. Over 16 years so ago, So yeah. I, can't, I can't really exactly remember. And, and remember, though... It doesn't feel like it's been 16 years, does no, it? No, it doesn't. Uh, what I do remember is that the day before it went into production, yeah. I called it off. I was so uncomfortable putting that content out there because there was, there was some exaggeration about scholars banning and gagging people from speaking about this time period. And so I called uh, one of the one of the. Was it like a rumor or, or? No, like well, there was there was an Arabic speaker who had done the same kind time of thing. period, okay. and one of the Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah banned. They said he banned it, and everybody would say Sheikh bin Baz banned it. Okay. Then so I called the Sheikh. I said, you know, I'm confident with the material, with the research I've done. Yeah. But I still feel uncomfortable. You know, Sheikh have banned it. He said, you know, the truth is, the Sheikh didn't really ban it. Oh, okay. But there was one region where. Nobody knew anything about what happened between the Sahaba. Okay. And then they got their hands on this cassette series. And then they started delving and, and correcting and, and saying this Sahabi was in the wrong. And like it opened oh, up. Oh, passing uh, opinions and judgment. Of yes. Yeah. Uh, that otherwise, they wouldn't have had that discussion if they didn't get their hands on it. So okay. in that area, he kind of said, don't sell it or something. But he didn't officially ban it either. Really. Okay. So he his unofficial ban... Mm -hmm. was more in reference to a specific production. Yeah. Okay. And so people start exaggerating and say, oh, Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, banned this set completely. So I'm like, okay, he like this major scholar is banning it, and here I am presenting it in the English language and making it available to people. Right, but it was your own research, though. It wasn't like you went back, went, it's not like you reproduced something that someone yeah, else did. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a combination of that, obviously, you know, you... In this, in I mean, this, you're always going to reference other Yeah, material. I mean, nobody creates stuff from zero, right? But, <laughs> but yeah. It was, unless uh, you go back in time, time travel. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. <laughs> Flux capacitor, here we come. Then I won't come back. <laughs> I'll just find any time period where Facebook didn't exist. I'm, like, I'm staying here. It, it was just, just, just a side note on, on, on that comment. One of the things that Sheikh Kamal had mentioned in, uh, in his uh, one of the first class we produced this week was the Ajuj and Majuj. Yeah. Right? And, and he was mentioning, or rather you were mentioning how if you had to choose between a time period. <laughs> yes. Like, you know, the cliche typical answer is like to live amongst the Prophet Because you think you'd be his best friend. Right. But like, what if you're not, right? I'd be right? with that with <laughs> but then, and then And then you made a really interesting point. And, you're, and it would not be the time of the Sahaba, but rather. No. What would it be? It would be, be the time... After Isa ibn Maryam comes down with the believers from like that perfect time of complete peace on earth, complete righteousness, every one of those people goes to Jannah, inshallah, right? Because there's not a single, and you forget deviant person, like yeah. there's not even a non believer on the planet. Shaitan has no influence, like everything is just amazing. Right. That's a guarantee right there. That would so, be the time to pick, so make sure. I would be in that time for sure. Oh. And if Facebook doesn't exist, it yeah, yeah. would be even better. No well, cell phones? You, well, you, you don't know what, what kind of social networks would exist. In the, well, why would it be a good times if they still have phones, man? I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, what, what so, the, well, we, we went like, where were we if we go backwards? The uh, fitna thing. Yeah, I was leading into the fitna thing. And, and I wanted to ask you about, like, how did you go about developing your research process? For, for just, just in for general, fitna or for the, the, the so, let, or so, so, the so let's talk about fitna, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing, the thing that I learned just this week is that you're an introvert yes right and which was surprising to me mm. because of how i guess it's because of your discipline and training that you're able to do what you do but and for anybody who's listening right how do you know you're an introvert or an extrovert just a real quick thing i'm sure everybody knows but it's like uh, i was on a road trip with sheikh muhammad one time mm -hmm. and and i'm i had you know i i, I 
when I'm in the car and I'm with just one person, I, I, I gotta talk. You're talking. I, I gotta talk. You I can't. killed him. I, you right? didn't have to finish the story. I know what happened. Hey, no, the thing is, the way he did it, though, it, it, it was, um, I guess you can say it in, in a very uh, appropriate way. Mm. He goes, um, you know, Bilal, there's two types of people, right? Wow. One type of people is that uh, they're energized when they're around people. And the other is they're energized when they're by themselves. And he's, uh, he's saying this and he's kind of looking out the window. And then he turns his head. He goes, I take it you're the kind that gets energized when you're around people. <laughs> That's so <right>? nice. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. You want me to shut up? <laughs> 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 yeah he's like yes please <laughs> wow look at that so but the, the, and the reason i say this is because it's like whenever i like if i'm trying to come up with something i'm doing do research develop a presentation i need to be talking to somebody i need to be mm. be with somebody but one of the things that you pointed out is the fact that you're by yourself yes right and you're not exhausted the opposite you're energized yeah. and, and and so there's that personality trait yeah coupled with like is like how did you go about like knowing like hey i gotta do research like how like like what training did you so, get, uh, find or seek to know because researching is a skill yeah i mean i guess okay like I, today's I, researching skills is what google that's it you google it you watch some youtube it's like, videos it's like alexa what is it <laughs> remember that book uh the end of expertise what is it the end of expertise yeah because right? everyone's an expert now i read right. read one article on Wikipedia, watch the video on YouTube. I know everything about this topic. Everything you want to know. I'll tell you, side talk, no, note here, but one of the, the doctors here in our masjid, he, he tells me, like, he's so frustrated with people who diagnose themselves oh, on YouTube. WebMD? And he's pain specialist, yeah. right? Uh, pain management, what do they call it? He said, people would come, I'd tell them you have this, and they would look me in the eye and say, no, I don't. I have such and such. And they'll keep arguing with him. And sometimes they'll just walk out thinking that, you know, the why did you come wrong. to me then? Right, right. Okay, so um, it's interesting. You said like to get your creative ideas, you talk it out, right? Yeah. And for me, even though I thought I was more of a, I actually have to write it out. Okay. Which is which most people are which visual, is, anyways. Sounds very tedious. Though. But uh, yeah, so that's why, like, I'll have dry. I love one of my favorite things in the world are dry erase markers. Okay. Okay. And windows. Sure. With no curtains. Okay. And I'll just write it out. Like I would write my course outline on this. I mean, on the you, on the you, window. You ever see the movie The Accountant with no. Ben Affleck? He does yes, yes, okay. like that one or like that. I don't know that genius mind thingy, beautiful. Mind, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, same yeah. idea. So I yeah. feel that I've never watched it, but you always see that in the trailer, yeah, yeah, the trailers, right? right? So, and then you'd erase it and then change it, and then and then, um, you know. Anyway, anyways, there's some interesting things about creativity also, and, and they tell you the mind, your brain is most creative when you're when you're relaxed, right? And that's why you get so many nice ideas in the shower, sure, right? Or you're uh, driving. <laughs> shout out to uh, one of the mashaykh, I'm not going to say, from uh -huh. Al-Maghrib, uh, that showers like th three to five times a day. Just for he says, creative I get the, ideas. Especially okay. for conferences, he's just oh. in the shower. He says, I get the best ideas. And so when I read that in a psychology book, I called him up. I'm like, hey, I figured out why you take so many, sh you know, so, so many showers. Right. Anyways. I don't know. I think you're giving a bit too much uh, credit. It's not like I did. I, I mean, I, I'm looking at it with admiration. And the reason is because it's not something that comes easy for me. Yeah. Right. Research is hard. And for me, like the research would be brute force method of going through and reading the book. Right. And I'm, a, and I'm the kind of person where like reading is hard. I'd rather listen to a book. But then like if I'm yeah. going to prepare a presentation, I need to know my stuff. Yeah. Just listening to it is not going to do it. Right. Listening to it might be like, All right, here's a good reference. Uh, but like the thing that I found out the way I learn, and I, this was literally my last semester in college, hmm. right? And native North Americans class. Okay. And the professor was basically like, here's the, the, the exam is going to be seven of these 12 questions. I'm not gonna tell you which seven, obviously you just need to know, know your stuff. Okay. And everything that I've spoken about in this class is not, not like no textbook either. Oh, right. It's just like everything I've spoken about, sure. You take notes, listen, whatnot. So. What I did was like, all right, I'm going through my notes and I'm like, I, I got to figure out a way. And out of my stress and anxiety, I found a method that worked. Mm. And the method was I would answer the questions, write it out. Okay. And then I would present the written form like I'm presenting in front of a class. But oh, then I record oh, the audio. Perfect. And then I'd listen to the audio on the way to school Smart. and I smash the exam. Good job. Yeah. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and that's when it, that's when it hit me. It's like, oh, and that's why I've kind of gravitated more towards digital media because it forces me to present. 
right? And, yes. and that presentation allows me to absorb the material nice. a little bit more. Again, but this is something that, that it's still tedious and hard and it, it came, really? like I wish I knew this stuff before I got into college. I used to use that technique in elementary school. Like I have a biology exam. Right. I would teach that chapter to my younger siblings. Right? Okay. But honestly, I've been in, um, teaching is my passion. I've been, officially started teaching in 1994. Okay. When I was four. I'm kidding. <laughs> 1994. I was like in, uh, I was a teenager, right? And, um, and when it's, your, I know it's a different, but when it's your passion, you don't get tired of it. You never get bored of it. You okay. actually feel you're energized by it. you feed okay. off of it you know that's why like in the old days when i do a lot of maghrib classes i'm speaking non-stop for sometimes i sleep three hours and i'm teaching and speaking non-stop then when the class is over you don't rest we go to dinner and it's question after question and i only realize that i'm tired after we get i walk into the hotel i'm like oh I'm my feet are, i never felt it before yeah, yeah. because the energy you know anyways so so i guess my going back to the original question is like how did you develop your methodology of research um, again, you're giving me way too much credit, I think. Okay, what like, is your methodology for uh, researching? I have to, like, prepare for this answer. I don't even know. <laughs> like, I, so, okay, then, you're expecting uh, something smart. I'm like, I read the books and then I uh, write the <laughs> stuff on the window. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because, like, your response here is, like, somebody's asking me, is like, yo, how do I get fit? I'm like, eat less, exercise more. <laughs> mm. <Okay. laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you're like what read the books take your notes like uh, right on the window and you get it. <laughs> so essentially it's, it's essentially putting in the work yeah but okay now let's let's be fair so and i i don't like pretend to take all the credit here okay. all right so okay i'll give you a story this you you mentioned uh you heard my battle of Badr, right yeah. and the same company put out my bottle of Uhud, but they only made something like 12 or 15 yeah, very copies. few I, I i tried so hard to get my hands on it nobody had heard it yeah. right but I was in New Jersey, and then uh, someone recognized me, and he came, they came to me and they said, oh, I heard your, I think it was Battle of Badr or Uhud, I heard one of your battles, and I would like to encourage you to re to listen to Sheikh So-and-So's Battle of Uhud okay. or Badr. Sure. And it was an English-speaking uh, speaker, and I said, why? He said, uh, just so you can get a, a different, hear a different one, a different perspective, something other than your own. And I'm like, I realized, poor guy. Okay, he. This is now. This is way in the two. This is before the two thousands, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is the nineties. Late nineties. So they they weren't many speakers. With all due respect, you know. I mean, honestly, a lot of these like big the shots, the growth of Al Maghrib in the uh, from the early two thousands into like the twenty tens was based on the one fact that oh, we've got instructors who have traditional education and speak English. Yeah. Right? That was like, whoa, your guy speaks English. Yeah, uh, that's That was a big deal. Yeah. They were very limited. And, I, and with all due respect, but let's throw out some names here. Like while, while this was happening, you know, Yasser Qadu was still studying overseas. And, uh, right. you know, all these people were just still... They, they, there weren't stateside. Yeah. Yeah, so this guy has on, only... He only knows of two, not series, but two audio lectures in English of the Battle of Uhud. Okay. So he's telling me, uh, you made one, uh, listen to the other one, so at least you've heard one in your life from someone else. And he doesn't know that in the preparation, because I speak Arabic, I have I have access to... You're going to the real source material. And I'm not even talking about speakers. Yeah. I'm talking about, I heard the Battle of Badr, for example, by ev at that point, at that point in time, Yeah. By I heard every available lecture in the Arabic language by speakers, students of knowledge, scholars, Knowledgeable speakers, Anything creative speakers, I mean on. everything. Right. And so you got gems from this guy, this personal gem from that other guy, and you just load it up, right? Okay. And so so sometimes That's like when brute force research, man. It, it is, it is. Okay. Uh, it, it, it reminds me because like one of my uh, final classes in college was how to write a book. Mm. Right. And essentially the the, the, the advice was you gotta find like seventy two books. I don't know where they came up with the list, but they're mm -hmm. like, that was a requirement for the class. Like, we need you to list 72 sources wow. that would cover the topic that you're going to write about. Right? And I'm like, dang, I'm not doing this, so I just fluffed. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Good job. <laughs> like, I'm done with school, man. <laughs> yeah, you have a degree in that, right? I have a degree you in have a BS business. In that? Uh, it's a B. Uh, yeah, it's, it actually is a Bachelor of Science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways. It's, it's like, I can, I, can ne I can never win. I can never win, right? <sighs> Especially with my dad, right? He's just like, uh, it's like, if you, if you get a BA, then you didn't do any math. My dad's an engineer. Mm. Right. If I get a, a BS, it's like you fall into that joke trap. Yeah. So 
whatever, man. <laughs> so, so anyways, what yeah. I was trying to do is distance myself from this expectation that I'm this research. I'm like, I had already, um, what is it, the blueprint to, to work off of and really just change stuff into English. Right. But then you still have to do, you still yeah, have like to You're read. making your own unique presentation, but you're going back to the original sources, yeah. that any sources that you can find. In painting, there is a rule and no no painter who has any self-dignity or respect does this. I need blue. I'm painting. This is oil painting or acrylic, right, right. right? I need blue. So I take a tube of blue and I squeeze onto my palette and I just dip my brush in it. That is like the biggest no-no. If I need green, okay. just squeeze green. and No, if I need green, I take blue, I take yellow, I mix it. I make green okay. and I make the shade of green that I want. And maybe not even. So you start with primary colors and you mix and match to get your color that you need. Yeah. Not a pre made non primary color. The rule is you okay. never paint out of a tube, ever. Okay. You mix and then you make that color and then the, the right hue, the right shade. So how do you make yellow? This yellow, what yellow is it? Is it a bright yellow? It's a very bright oh, so sunlight. I get white. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Do I add white to it? Do I add a little bit of red? Do I add a little bit of orange? Okay. Do I add green to this? Because maybe the sun is behind the trees and there's some greenish uh, on it, you know. It's always like So like what that. is the grade of the color? Yeah, exactly. What is okay. the grade of the color? But the way it comes out of the tube, it's like hard. you're never going to yeah. use it like that. Okay. You know, that's some Bob Ross stuff. Like that. <laughs> now, the thing is, so in cooking, I use the same principle. I'm wondering how many people know what Bob Ross is. That are watching I'm wondering this. too. Like, I was like, whatever, it's dated. I don't just, care. Just Google it, guys. That rule helped me because I moved it over to cooking. Okay. So if I'm making, you know, barbecue ribs, for example, yeah. never, ever would I take barbecue sauce, squeeze it out of a, a like a tube, in, or out of the, yeah. the bottle from the store, squeeze into the bowl and then just dip my ribs in it. Never. Okay. You got to make that sauce your own. So I'm going to add some garlic powder to that sauce. I'm going to add some onion powder to that. So I'm going to mix it up and I'm okay. going to add pepper and salt. So it's kind of like, uh, it basically, basically what you're talking about is similar to what a Desi uh, mother, uh, mm -hmm. when, when it comes to spices. Yes. Right? So if you take uh, uh, like a... So, uh, this is something I learned with Pakistanis, mm -hmm. right? Like my, they, when they take a brand known as Shan Masala, mm -hmm. right? Which is a really spicy thing, but like if you just take it and you mix it, like any traditional mom would be like, what are you doing? Mm. Right? Like make like their, their whole thing is that yes. they would make their own thing. They, would, yes. they know how much of the packaging to actually take out, not put the whole thing in and burn your insides. I like that. Yes. <laughs> good, good, good. So it's, it's the same idea. It's just like... Absolutely. So know, uh, knowing what you're looking for. See, I make my... Like when I make karate chicken, I make it like that. Okay. But no self-respecting Daisy would do that. It's not acceptable. <laughs> you know? It's just... You know? <laughs> every, every second generation Daisy would do that. Yes, of course. <laughs> but, you know... When it comes to the research, your method... So is it fair to say that the approach that you take is more like, okay, what is it that you're trying to find? Who's taught, who's spoken about that? What is it that you're trying to present? Yes. And you refer back to the sources appropriately. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to make it like the barbecue sauce. I'm not yeah. just going to translate every word this person said. Right. Especially with the series. But I've done that like with a small lecture. Like if you remember a thousand years ago in Mauritania. Yeah. 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 That was a good one. That one. I love that lecture. Yeah. And and the reason, and that's one of the ones that I very much promote. Like that, that, that's like an audible cinematic Right? Uh, like story. It's beautiful, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, you're right about that. You do look at things from that angle. Um, but I was listening to a, a lecture by a, a sp superb speaker and a superb analyst. His name is Dr. Raghab Sarjani. Okay. I'm a huge fan of his and everything. And I heard that. In Arabic, it's called Man Hum Al-Murabitun. Who are the Murabitun? Right. And I loved it. And I was like, I got to share this. But it's really, it's not that long. It's like right. 40 minutes of talk. Yeah, yeah. So actually, that one, I translated it. I mean... Initially, back in those days, and then later on, found other information and stuff. But like on a whole series, you're not going to translate it word for word, so you're going to make it yours by doing adding things. And it, 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 it's very similar to like um, so in the world of design, one of the most notable, I guess, authorities is a gentleman by the name of Eric Speakerman. This guy makes fonts. Oh, right, like nice. that. That's how amazing he is. So uh, now here's a, the issue that a corporation or a company has is that if you use a copyright font, then you have to pay licensing fees to use that and everything. And that's how they make their money. Yeah. Right. Now, no company, no, no self-respecting entrepreneur is going to want to have to deal with licensing fees. Yeah. So what do they do? They go to Eric Speakerman. Oh. They're like, look, we need this font from the layman's perspective. We like the aesthetic of this font. Yeah. Can you create us a font that looks like that? 
so that we can't tell the difference, but technically and legally, it's not the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So what does he do? He basically looks at all the fonts, the, all the characteristics, the curves, the uh, w where the uh, where the serifs are, where the serifs are not, all of that. S sleeps on it, mm. gets up the next day, and in his mind he thinks he's recreating the font. But obviously there's influence yeah. from all of his educational background and everything. Very smart. And the end result is something fresh, yeah. right? And so your presentations is like that. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, I mean, it is fair. And, and also, <laughs> yeah, and in the old days now, I would make the mistake of like trying to sound like a 70-year-old sheikh, right? Okay. And then I remember I had this series and I was just, just sounding like Ibn Uthaymin, just the same way, serious. And then one day, I just, I was myself, which, yeah. which could mean a bad thing. It could mean just excessively joking or throwing puns wherever they showed up and and people were cracking up. And I remember this one guy, I met him four years later, and he's telling me the exact joke. He that still remembers just... and stuff. And um, and I'm like, okay, first I was being fake. I was being someone else. Yeah. I wasn't enjoying the process. Yeah. And then now I can inject myself into it. And it, it became fun and it became mine in a way. What do you feel or what led you to find your voice? Um, I think in my case, it was just being so bored of not having my voice, you know, okay. that I just said, you know, I'm just going to say what I feel like saying here. I mean, obviously, within, staying with the material and staying yeah. appropriate. Uh, but and, yeah. and then from that on, from there on, uh, like the, the institute where I used to give those lectures, then they asked me to become one of the board members. And then they asked me to become one of the regular lectures. And then I became a chaplain of university. And then I would become invited to other schools around the country. And then I got around the world, invited around the world, and, and it just grew from there. But That's the value of being you. Yeah, it really is. Well, if that's a lesson from this, yeah. like, just and, and don't even force it. Just be yourself. I'll tell you, I don't want to be mean here, but I'm usually a little bit mean, right? And like, you know one of the fakest things? And one of the brothers was talking to me about this. He says, a brother, like white guy, born and raised in America, yeah. all right? And then he takes his shahada, mm. And he starts speaking with an Arab accent. You know, like, I've seen no, that. brother, we got to go over here. And what are you doing? Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. Or so, <laughs> and for a while, that was the thing also where you have this broken accent because the speakers back then had the broken accent, you know? And it was the cool thing. But you, it's faking. And I'm just, I'm faking you, to you, you and you're faking. You know, this, back is, to this me. is not just for like that. Like, I, I've seen that. In the martial arts community as well. Really? Right. It's just like people like and and this is like, also like a Brazilian or what? Well, <laughs> regardless, right? So, so like even amongst the Brazilian jiu-jitsu folks, like mm -hmm. there, like there, there's this whole thing about how I guess back when it wasn't that well known, mm -hmm. right? And people learn with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy, who's born and raised here, now he's talking with a Brazilian accent. Wow. Right. But I mean, it's faking it. Interesting. Right. Thinking that is it good be, for business? Maybe. Uh, I mean, uh, but the, the one thing I can appreciate about the jujitsu community is that they're very, um, very oh, they're vigilant. They're, they're vigilant. They're huh? vigilant with making sure that people who are teaching, like there's a there's a whole database called the uh, uh, one of the databases is through the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation, mm. where like if you've competed, you're registered there, and so if you claim to be a black belt, then uh, like you'll be somewhere in some database, um, and if you're not, then people will actively look up your lineage. Really? Right. They're like, okay, who did you get your belt from? Mm. And then they'll go check up with that person. Like, did you ever get, give this guy a belt? Subhanallah. Right? And really? Yeah. No joke, huh? And, and many times, like, for example, in a, in a country like India, where there's very little, if any, jujitsu presence. Yeah. Somebody might be claiming, oh, I'm a black belt in jujitsu. I got it from so-and-so. Mm. And, and somebody did a research with so-and-so. Like, yo, did you? They can verify, huh? Yeah. And the guy's like, well, I, like, he took couple classes and i gave him some belts but not a black belt interesting <laughs> you know that you just reminded me of uh, actually a little known fact in the field of ilm al-hadith mm. the when a muhaddith let's say like imam malik is giving his chains of narrations to students they used to not imam malik specifically but right. but they used to actually take uh, the roll call like the attendance yeah and so that they have a record that so and so heard from so and so. Okay. It wasn't just like, oh, I heard so and so say. And that's why there's this uh, story where Imam Ahmad and Ali ibn Madini they walked into the Khalifa's courtroom, you know, his his, yeah. and there was a guy standing and he was saying, 
حدثنا احمد بن حنبل and he was just make, they've never seen him before in their life but he's saying i heard from ahmed ibn hanbal so then they came to him they approached him he's a liar and they said like i am ahmed ibn hanbal and this is ali ibn al madini he says how ignorant you guys are do you really think you're the only ahmed ibn hanbal on on earth and the only ali ibn al madini there's another one you know but it was like that same level oh and on another note by the way i myself i'm very um, closely attached to things brazilian mm. there's avenida fogo de chao and <laughs> <laughs> Very much attached to those places. Hey, Fogo de Chao is great. It is amazing. Oh, man. It's just, you come up with an idea like that, flip it to green and then flip it back to red when you can't it's, handle it's it. It's expensive, though. It is. <laughs> yeah. So now, th- this brings me to the fact that the- these last two, uh, last week, we've been producing two classes, Yajuj and Majuj, and Confidential, Tafsir Soto Nur. Yeah. Let's start with Yajuj and Majuj. Mm-hmm. Like, you're a Dawah guy. Right, your communications discipline, right? Yeah. Well, how'd you end up here? Um, it's not very far from there, okay. right? It's right around the corner. Okay, so I'll tell you something that I'm very um, like I'm I'm intrigued by how people think. Uh, so I always tell people my favorite subject after religion or Islam mm. is psychology. Okay. Okay, so I have most of my books will be on psychology, and it just comes natural to me. You know, I mean. Again, this whole toot your own horn thing, right? But, but like, I'll, I'll, if I read about a theory, I know how to apply it in many different ways. Sure. And, and I can you, you, solve you, you, you look for the practical application of the theory that you just All understood. the time. Yeah. So, I mean, you um, should be doing that. If you're not doing that, this is like, then you're just a geek. That's like a big part of da'wah. The big yeah. part, a big part of da'wah is not just, you know, how do I communicate well, but it's like, what's happening in your mind? Like the whole t- shahada in 10 minutes, and sometimes we have a shahada in five minutes. Right. Like how, I want to get in your mind and figure out the problem there and present it in a way that's digestible based on however your mind is put together. What you just said right there is marketing 101. There, problem solution. Is? Okay, nice. Right, like it's that. like, because at the end of the day, you're trying to put together a product, get it to market. Well, what problem are you solving for them? Yeah. Even if people don't know who you are, what you do, right? And who you do it for, at least you begin with the problem. And as long as you're providing solutions, you've got a, a product to sell. But you, after a while, though, you get really good at it. I mean, I'm not trying to say I'm really good, but I'll tell you some things. Like, I'm good at reading people, but I would where I would like to get at reading people is reading micro-expressions. Oh, okay. Paul Ekman stuff. Yeah, and that's... I've tried a lot. It's you, really you, a, you ever see Lie to Me? Huh? The series? Yeah, I mean, I saw the pilot on it. Oh, okay. I understand now that it's much harder than what you might think. Oh, micro-expressions, you no, know. It's, it's training. It, it's it, really hard. I mean, uh, one of the things I appreciate, now, I first heard of this gentleman by named Paul Ekman from Malcolm Gladwell's book, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. uh, it was in the book Blink. Blink, right? yeah. Right? They're like, okay, how do you, how can you read people, not just body language, but just like what you mentioned, micro-expressions. Yeah. And they actually developed a software to train you to mm. identify, and it's primarily used amongst law enforcement uh, yeah. so that they can kind of understand, engage what they're dealing with. But, uh, but yeah, like, like you said, but it's you not... get good at it. Like, yeah. I mean, not micro the other stuff. So uh-huh. one time I'll tell you, give you an example. I'm giving a lecture, this big lecture hall. It was conventions and, sure. and it's dark. Lights are on me and it's dark. And there's a guy who comes walking up as I'm giving a lecture towards the end. Yeah. He comes walking up the aisle and then he sits down somewhere in the front. Okay. And from the way he was walking, I was like, this guy has problems in his life. He has a big oh, problem no. in his life. Okay. Yeah. But he wasn't like, you know... He was just walking. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like, this guy has problems in his life. Okay. So after the, when the lights came on and everything, turns out I, I mean, I didn't know him, but I kind of, so he goes, uh, yeah, Sheikh, I want to ask you uh, about a problem. And he asked me about a very simple problem. Okay. When he was over, I just, I just looked him in the eye and said, look, but that's not the real problem you want to ask me about. And his eyes went like this. Right. I said, there is a bigger, a much bigger problem in your life. And he started crying. Oh. And then he told me what it was. Right. Or one time I got on the airplane. And the stewardess, this was Emirates Airlines, and she just goes, you know, welcome aboard, whatever. And I was like, she's sad. Mm. And I sat down, and then it was like 14 hours from Dubai till when we finally landed. We started chit-chatting as the plane is taxiing, and I said, you know, I don't know how I brought it up, but it was very tactfully. It wasn't like, you're sad? <laughs> so, yeah, you look very sad. <laughs> so, I brought it up in a very indirect way, and she goes... Um, so did you notice that? I said, the minute I got on the plane. She said, was it that bad? I said, no, nobody else would have seen it. Right. But I caught it. And I rec- and then I advised her to read the Quran. It actually turns out that her father was Muslim by name, mm. her whole life growing up, but he didn't practice and her mother was something else and right. she kind of got lost. And 
she, encouraged she, she her. She was seeking purpose in her life kind of yeah, situation. Yeah, very much so. Okay. But anyways, so, so you, I mean, and, and my other thing is that from the way people uh, put their sentence together, the fact that they put this word, and I cannot explain this. I spoke to Sheikh Walid about this, and he said that that does qualify as a type of firasa. Which, okay. I don't know. There's not exactly. You mentioned firasa, and this is one of the things that like I've always been fascinated by. Mm. And the way it's always presented by shiuch, and whenever they talk about sira, they're like, this person can read minds. Mm, they say minds. No, huh? but like the way that they present it's it. Almost it's almost as if they can read minds. But, like, but they present it as something mystical and only some people have the gift for it. Like, granted, there's talent and stuff involved. And but the hadith kind of hints that it's specific. You know, but you also can study it. Right. The, the, yeah. the, but the thing is, I think only recently that like the, the, these sciences and these trainings have developed. I'm just wondering why why don't we know what they did and how they developed it? Yeah, I mean, Imam Shafi'i studied it for five years in Al Yemen. Okay. And the Westerners have Firasa, they call it physiognomy. But the only issue I have with the Western study of, of Firasa or physiognomy is right. basically it's too textbook. Like if a person has a nose like this, then he is that. So it's, it's, so, too so much. it's over technical. Yeah, over technical. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but whereas in for the Muslims, it's also a combination of things. Intuition. And intuition. There's and that's why the Hadith says the believer sees with almost like with the believer heart. sees with the light of Firasa or something okay. like that. Okay. Okay. You know, so it's a bunch of things there, and I like that it's not too technical. So and because because I mean maybe I, I found the the mystical aspect of it because a lot of times people relate or associate philosophy with dream interpretation. There is a bit of that. Okay. But there was also, by the way, there was also face readers. Right. Okay. I mean, I guess in a way it can be linked to the field of philosophy. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'm that technical that I can. Yeah. But but you remember the the story of when the Prophet was a, was a young boy and, and he took him to these face readers and. And this one of them was just, we saw the Prophet and he just kept staring at him. Mm. Like he could, something is there, Something's something is, I've about never this seen this before. Yeah. And he kept staring at him and following him to the point that um, his grandfather felt uncomfortable and just took him away. So okay. let's get out of here. <laughs> okay. He actually kept, got the man busy looking at something else and they got out. Okay. He, he wasn't even going to leave them, you know? Right, right. So I know there was something great there, but, but. So I guess that is a kind of philosophy because you can read into, you know. Okay. So mine is with um, the way people structure their sentence. Okay. But this is not like every day. Like my wife asked me, what do you want for lunch? I'm like, you look like you want to make chicken. It's not like that. It's only that way related. How amazing would that be though? That would be great. <laughs> be like, what are you thinking of? Only with that way. when that way yeah. kicks in, right? Because at, at the end of the day, you don't have anything else to go off of because you don't know the individual. Yeah. Right? You can read, maybe read their body language, how they're speaking, how yeah. they're uh, the, the, using their words. Uh, but, but for me, the way to construct the sentence, it can quickly tell me what the problem is or I just can figure stuff out. I can't explain it. Maybe one day we'll be hanging out and I'll tell you. Okay. If it does happen, I'll let you. I'll be like, Bilal, that guy right there, if we speak to him, he'll take shahada instantly in like two, three minutes. Mm, okay. I can always sense one that... Actually, it happened to me before I moved to Houston. I came for Texas Dawa with a friend of mine. We're at... We went to a good restaurant. Mm. The... Texas Dawa took us to this restaurant. Yeah. It was so good. Okay. And we're not going to come back to it. It's in the schedule. We right. once as speakers go to this restaurant. It was so good. I stole the card, stole a card from that restaurant, had the address. We came back, my friend and I okay. left the conference, snuck into that restaurant, ate again. It was that good. Then we're coming back. We stop at the light. And the guy just crossed the street in front of us. Mm. And he just looked at us and he goes like this. <laughs> so then the light turned green. We started driving. My friend's driving. Yeah. I told him, you know that guy? If we speak to him, he'll take the shahada immediately. Mm. My friend didn't say, oh, really? That's nice. And keep driving. He just made a U-turn. Boom. Okay. Instantly. That guy was a man's man. I loved him. He turned right away. Okay. We went to him. Get in the car. <laughs> I mean, not that rough, you know. But yeah, we're like, where are you going? Get in the car. Okay. We took him home. And so in the meantime, we're talking to him. It was just like a na whatever minute right. drive. Took him to his home. Yes. Okay. So, like, where you, like, you're walking. This is a technique. We'll, we, we'll give you a ride, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because it buys you talking time. Right. 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 We learned this technique from one of our 16-year-old great du'a. Right. When someone says, "I'm too busy," and this is DC, they're walking. Right. I'll walk with you. Yeah. You buy yourself like nine minutes. Of course. Of, of course. Of course. Anyways, so he got in the car. Is it just just a side tangent? Hmm. Observation I made in, when I was working in DC uh -huh. is uh, so this is the difference between a homeless person getting fed versus not getting fed, uh -huh. right? 
people sitting on the side of the street, checking the thing, sir, can you help me with, or whatever, right? Almost nobody ever pays attention. Mm. Dude, I've noticed this several times, different people, and every morning my routine was I get off the train, I go to the Verizon Center, you know, get some breakfast, but I just kind of chill there for like maybe 10, 15 minutes. Okay. And the thing that I notice is that from the Verizon Center to cross the street, is a bit of a long light mm-hmm. uh, because it's a busy intersection. This, I, I would notice some the homeless people that got fed, they'd go over, match their pace with whoever they're speaking, and maybe they're doing it oh. in, in, intuitively. Oh, so smart. Right? They match their pace. And as soon, I guess they're building rapport. And again, I, I, I don't believe they're doing it deliberately. It's just, they, it's just in, in, intuitive for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they say, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am. I'm really hungry. Can you buy me breakfast, buy me lunch or whatever? And almost every time, so I'm just like, here, I, I got you. But those guys were smart, though. Yeah. Like, they just figured it out, Yeah. you know? I mean, I guess it's a matter of staying hungry or not. Yeah, exactly. Right. You gotta get, you gotta eat. Hustle. So your your passion for learning psychology, how does that lead into your Jewish my Jewish? So for years, for over a decade, like I would travel around the world, and people would ask me, "Have you heard of such a speaker?" And he basically a speaker. He, the speaker knows history well, mm. and he knows politics very well. Sure. But his his knowledge of Islam, and I'm trying to be nice here. We've got five cameras was like, is subpar to say the least. Okay. You know, if I put a banana and I put, uh, you know, some strawberries and I put some milk and I put some chocolate and some honey and then, then I throw a sweet. little baby roach there, <laughs> it's going to disappear. You're not going to like be, um, there's a faint hint of roach. You're not going to catch it. So the, the garbage, he would just mix it with all the other good stuff that he knows so well. Right. And then people start to just eat up his nonsense. So it's very much t- tied to da'wah because when you're being persuasive, right? Yeah. You also think of, okay, when I say this, what's the guy in the other mindset, with the other mindset, what's he going to say as a refutation to me? Mm. So you have the... So you're thinking about it in terms of debate. Yes, and you refute the, there's a better term, the refutation or the, re- the but- rebuttal yeah. before they even say it. Right. So that when you present something in the end, it's like just tight. There's no way around it. That right. when they try that, you've already answered that. So and this I is like, like media training right here, one on one. Yeah, I mean, no, because it's like when you get on the news, right? Like you got to know what your talking points are, and you got to know the, re- the, the rebuttal to the say. rebuttal of the talking point. Well, I had some good teachers, man. I had this one guy. He would appear on Fox News and stuff, but he would teach us the techniques they right. use, right? I remember he put he would put us in groups and just have us debate, but like TV style, okay. not like high school debate club sure, style, sure, sure, sure. but like political style, TV style, and yeah. everything. And and one. Th- one of the techniques, well, our group wanted to, we were representing somebody. Arnold had a scandal something or something like that. Okay. And one of us was Arnold. One of us was the other guy running sure. against him. This is at a time he's running and then there's a scandal. Right. And I was like, I would, I would, I would bring up the scandal. Okay. And they're like, um, you, no, 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 okay. don't bring it up. Yeah. And so uh, when, we, when our group went up for the debate, whoever our representative was, she goes, she did a great job. And then right when the debate was over, the other team goes, well, at least I don't do this, this, this to the women. Mm. She brought up the scandal. And that was the end of the show. So she ended on that note. She destroyed us. Right. And I told, I was like, I told you. And the professor said, you should have start, You should have brought that up. Yeah. Because now she just killed you with that. At so the, the end, the idea of owning that your bomb. weaknesses. Absolutely. Yeah. Or you then, you, and then not only did they drop the bomb on you, but they also, that was the last thing. And people always remember how, right, how it, it ended. How it ended. Yeah. Anyways, I don't know how I got into all that. You talk about some dude who uh, uh, speaks on the subject matter, uh, politics and history, but then absolute garbage. Yeah. So I was like, can I, can I put together a class that will just undo this decade of nonsense, the okay. people who have really delved into it? Or I imagine as I'm preparing it, the, the biggest and most hardcore fan of that guy Okay. Who believes everything he does? If it says if he attends my class, how do you positively? How do I him? completely convince him? Right. Like I'm even shooting for completely convincing. So, so just... essentially, the, what you're trying to address is the problem of misinformation. Yeah, it regarding is. the subject matter of Yajuj and Majuj. Completely. Right. And completely. how I guess people tend to bring Hollywood into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the and also the lack of detail and information yeah. allows for more misinformation because right. you fill in people fill in the blanks and you and know change one, the story. One of the things that uh, a couple of my friends in the past have said is like, "Yo, why do people have to take creative liberties with history and all these different amazing stories? Because there's so much there." It wasn't until I actually learned about the art of storytelling 
is that, in fact, there's so many gaps in history. You, and, oh, yeah. and storytelling is all about the character's emotional journey, yeah. not the plot. The plot is simply a vehicle for you to take the emotional journey through. And I think a lot of folks, when, especially when it comes to things like the signs of the Day Judgment, the story of Isa bin Maryam, the story of Mahdi, the story of Dajjal, the story of Yajuj Majud, and everything is going to take place. Like, there's only specific stuff that's authentic. Yeah. But then there's a whole lot of things that are kind of, what about the character's emotional journeys? Yeah, right? that, that's true. And like, for example, when, when they did the Omar series, which yeah. I haven't watched, but I re- respect it a lot. I've heard many, heard many great things from about my, it. From NBC where... Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, I got three episodes and I was so bored. I, oh, really? I did not finish. Okay. Sorry. I'm kind of <laughs> like you. I just want to say that. <laughs> it's but, the same thing with Integral, right? But uh, like... <laughs> oh, yeah, I never not, even started. Oh, man. So I've seen like maybe parts of maybe three episodes. Parts really? of it, right? And I don't know. To me, and I'm going to get a lot of hate for this and feel free to lay it out in the comments yeah. but it looked like a really cheap Turkish soap opera like the bad acting I mean I always understood it. that's what it was uh, <laughs> let, me, let me stay out of this let me stay out so, of this somebody told us like no bro you gotta get into it you gotta uh, watch at least a few episodes I'm like how many episodes like watch at least six episodes and I'm like that's like that's over bad s- writing if I have to wait for six episodes before I start to get it's like pulled into it over six but then again you're dealing with like what I don't know 400 episodes I've heard people say things like Wait till season one's over. Like, this is very bad if I have to get hooked in by the yeah, second season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So, uh, it's like a bad marriage. Like, I've never liked you, but, you know, I'm we're here. We're, we rented this place together. Oh, uh, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why. But you're talking about Omar, right? The Omar series? Yeah. You, you have to fill in the blanks. Like, I know Omar didn't say it's hot today like he did in the series. But you have to fill in these blanks, right? But what's interesting is, uh, especially in the old days, if I give a khutbah, Okay, like you have a video of me giving a khutbah in, let's say, you know, 2007. Mm. And then you find another video on YouTube of the same khutbah in 2012. Yeah. It's going to be word for word the same. Okay. You Even know, pause for pause sometimes. With you, for sure. Because I remember what the opposite I, of you, right? With the opposite of me, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll change, I'll play with it. Yeah. Uh, and it'll evolve. Yeah. Uh, it, whereas with you, I remember the second time I took your 10-minute shahada class, mm-hmm. You literally opened up with like, for those of you who already taken the class, I'm going to tell you the same jokes, beat for yes. beat, everything's going to be, ex- yeah. and it was exactly the same, yes. and it was good. Mm. You know, it's like a it's like a comedian doing his shtick. What I'm trying to say is though, I, I'm I actually cannot stand any exaggerations. Okay. Um, I, I don't like uh, what's the word embellishments to a story. I cannot tolerate that. Gotcha. Because you know. Especially when you know what the truth thing is. Yeah. So when I listen to a sheikh and he's like, and then the wind blew. It does not say the wind blew in the hadith. You just <laughs> added that. And I understand when you're creative, you're being creative. But when I'm giving a lecture and I'm telling you in this hadith, and then then he looked up with a tear in his eye. There was no mention of a tear in his eye. <laughs> my, my dad has the same issue with really? a lot of the history books. Yeah. Uh, especially Islamic history. And yeah. it's just like, what is it with these people? It's like, And then he turned his head. This is like who? <laughs> and I, I'm like your dad. I can sniff that. I'm yeah. like that. I can I can underline all that stuff. Yeah. Like, this is all added. This is okay. So it's just the issue with the Ajuj Majud. You wanted to address the uh, the issue of uh, misinformation. Also yeah. in in the in the situation with Tafsir uh, Sultan Nur. Yeah. Right. Like what kind of led you? And again, it's just I'm looking at it from a perspective of like here's a guy at Dawa and now understanding like communications and yeah. psychology. Like, where does Surah Nur and its stuff fit in there? Surah Nur, the idea first came not because of the Sharia-related stuff. I actually learned that later when I decided to do Surah Nur in Canada. But uh, I'll tell you where it started. When I was 17 or something, the imam of uh, the masjid behind our house in in Sudan, he said, I'm going to be, you know, masajid are close to each other. Sure, sure, sure. Masjid so-and-so, I'm going to be doing a series of uh, Tafsir Surah Nur. Okay. But he started, I don't know where he started. But anyways, I remember I used to go. I was very young. I was go to that that class. Yeah. And and I loved when he went into the etiquettes and rules of visitation. Yeah. And then, and no insult to anyone here, but when I when I moved to the US, I found like people have no clue about these wonderful little like rules. Like I told you, your phone rings. Hey, can you hand me my phone? The guy looks at the name and then hands you. Why? Okay, this guy came to my house one time. I sat him down and I'm looking for a document. Yeah. And every time I open the drawer yeah. from wherever he's sitting, he goes like this. Oh, man. What's okay. inside? Like he wants to see what's inside the drawer. Yeah. 
So what do you like, want, man? The inspector here, or just just sit down and let me get this thing. We get out of or, here. Or the more annoying thing when you're on an airplane and you're on your laptop, person's like, "What do you got over there?" Right? Yeah. <laughs> like you know, if, if I'm sitting next, you don't need that thing. I'm never taking a peek into your, you know, or or the trunk of your car. We, like people pick me up at you the know, airport. Th- th- there's a reason why those um the the screens that come in, the privacy screens, yeah. where like you look at it from here or here, you can't even see yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that so, when I got mine, that was the whole marketing. Like yeah. no one, no nosy guy next to you can read what you're writing. Yeah, you know, but you know, but that, but those are I keep referring to this term that like as the niceties, like right. they're just sweet little things here and there that we lost. Yeah, um, you know, like I told you in in my line of work, you know, in the old days with Al Maghrib, people yeah. always picking you up and then they take your bag, put it in their trunk. Right before COVID hit. Go over <laughs> and then this one guy he says i noticed when i opened my trunk you didn't look inside you turned away i said yeah because it's not in my business and he was like really shocked at that you know but but these niceties are, are kind of lost and I, so initially i noticed when i when i came in i was young right but i noticed that people don't know a lot of the rules and etiquettes and rules of visitation and which from that you build the rules of using the cell phone people were breaking rules like one time this guy called me 34 times and wow. it went to voicemail each time so and they would get the hint and then there was nothing exactly forget <laughs> that he forget the hint like he but i knew what he was calling but there was no urgency yeah and it became in the end uh, just a challenge between me and him like i'm not going to answer yeah and he's like i'm not going to stop calling oh. and he called me 34 times and then he it's, called this other guy don't be that salesperson <laughs> I wish it was even it was just nonsense yeah he once called this other guy and he was boasting to me he's like I swear to God I called this guy 54 times I was like his record he's proud of it okay. and then in the end he called his wife and lied to her he spoke a little bit of Urdu so he's like I'm calling he's like I'm calling from Karachi emergency hey jaldi karo jaldi karo where is oh, no. where is brother so and so so she runs and gets him and he's like salam alaikum <laughs> it's me <laughs> anyways so that was like okay we need to know these rules and then and then when I, uh, so I did it in Canada. It was like a Friday class, like yeah. just a one hour or 50 minutes every Friday. Sure. So over a long stretch until we finally finished the surah. But in the process, you know, you learn so much about, again, the the philosophy, the, the process in the Islamic courtroom. And even until that point, I had never been exposed to that. Yeah. Like I always say, none of us lived in a Muslim state. We don't know how it looks right. or how it feels to be in a Muslim state. Right. Is it like oppressive? Is it like the Wild West? Was it just normal? It's a mystery. Because, yeah, because we, we, we have documentation. So I said, yeah. you know what? I'm going to do that in this course. I'm going to give people that feel. I'm going to let them enter a Muslim courtroom. Right. I mean, just everything short of reenacting and pretending to be a judge. The, 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 thing, the thing that I find interesting uh, that I appreciated in the presentation was it wasn't so much about like, hey, let's create something fictional, right? You're actually pulling real cases. Yeah. Right, yeah. Re- real situations like le- that set precedent uh, for application during the time of the Prophet yeah. and you know in other in other times, and, and how that could look like today, yeah. right? And and, ra- and and the reality is you know that there's no like Islamic court system here, but there's so much that we can apply as genuine ethics in our lives today when dealing with our whether it be on the job, the family members, our community. Um, and I think the thing that I feel like was the greatest takeaway, and I feel that what you spent a lot of time on mm. in the class of Sotonur was the issue of like beginning with zina, right? And then that leading into the, the slander of Aisha radiallahu yeah. anha. And, and, and the thing that you said was how important it is for us to not talk about things we have no business. I'm telling you. People... <sighs> What can I say? We can divide people. Like, in, there's a group that just sits and makes du'a and qunut, ya, ya Allah, the next candle. Like, I need it. You know? And then there's... <laughs> there's that, a reason why gossip columns are huge. Yeah, right? And the question, the, the question that I have in all of this, hmm. how do you reconcile and balance between this idea of, like, all right, you don't need to comment on things that you don't have any business in versus this whole activism of, like... That that is the heart of the problem. Okay. Like everybody is the activist, you know. Okay. Everybody wants to be out, and then, and they're willing to, not all of them, but many of them are willing to 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 offer you as a sacrifice so their name gets. You know, maybe some years ago, you know, one 
when instructor someone started to put lies against them and attack them and make it look like I'm fighting for people's rights, you're against them, mm. and just so they can become, you know, get some notoriety and what have you. I had a similar case where I was in this one city, and in class I said the N word. Mm. I did not say the N word. Yeah. I said the N word. Okay. What I literally just said. Literally, the yeah. N word. That's, yeah, what, the, it, that's, that's what, what I said. said. Exactly. Okay. okay. And she comes up to me at the end. It's like, I didn't think it was appropriate that you said the N word. I'm like, you know, I didn't say it. Like, yeah, but that was not appropriate. Like, you do know you're Bengali. <laughs> like, this does not involve you. It's like, you're talking to a black guy. <laughs> it's not involve you whatsoever. You're Bengali. And she's like, I understand. And you said, don't come up to you with nonsense. I'm like, I don't know what you want right now. Anyways, I finished the class. And then when I left town, mm. she went to the imam, the masjid board, oh, no. try to get newspapers and try to make herself that heroine who fights against racism. You know, how, 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 how are you going to go up against a black dude on the issue of the N word when you're not black yourself? But it's just, it, you know, she can create a ruckus and be that new yeah. activist, you know, thing. Where like, so like I gotta defend the the rights of the woman who got abused by this person. Like just stay out of it. You, who are you, their mother? Stay out of it. You know. So so the question is, when does that line get crossed, or rather, when do you become an activist? At what point is it like? like okay. Is there a balance? Because I don't uh, even know. I'm not gonna pretend I know. But I'll yeah. tell you one thing: when you just echoing or just parroting whatever people are already saying you're not doing anything special here okay. okay like but like let's say something is happening and nobody's doing anything about it then you're really a hero here you like you're the you're ta tackling so, there's it there's some harm happening yeah okay but there's like no serious issue you're just trying to become known you try, try to create it like that again that's that instructor this lady put words in his mouth completely lied against him okay and she became really popular okay. you know but so, so it's so damaging. So now I want to be that next guy. A scandal happens, I start sticking my nose into it. Okay. And you're not helping anybody. It's you're like, not it's securing like you're anyone's you want to rights. Break the news or the next thing. Yeah. Okay. You're not securing anyone's rights. There was one scandal, and I just said, and right when it came out, like before I even hit the social media, I got inside information. Okay. So I just said, you know, stay out of it. I said, in the next couple of weeks, thousands of people are going to get a lot of sins. Yeah. Stay out of it. Who's with me? Mm. Few people like I'm with you. I'm with you. Then they're like, "What about defending the right?" I'm like, "Yeah, who are you? you defending what? You're just gonna delve into it. You're not gonna help anybody. You're not re related or or involved with anyone in of the parties. Yeah. You're just gonna yap and make noise, and nothing's gonna happen. Mm. You're just gonna get sins. And I got a tax for saying, "Stay out of it." <laughs> what about defending people's honor? Okay. Yeah, Habib, who made me the Public, the get out of here, <laughs> right? Anyways, I'm trying to stay nice, you know. But so I guess it, it becomes an issue of like when something is, it, when there is a slander, when there is a scandal, so to speak. It's like unless you're directly involved, unless you can genuinely help. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, what? I hate to, you know, it's a cliche, but you you really are just adding fuel to the fire. Mm. You're just adding the number of, uh, you know, you're one more view to how many people viewed it. Right. You're one more video to, you know, people who viewed the video. You're just adding fuel to the fight. You're making it bigger than what it is. Gotcha. I told you there was a, I think I th said this in the course, there was a, it's a true story. There was a huge scandal in one place where I was living. Like it was gi ginormous. Okay. And I said, it doesn't involve me. The, even if I know what happened, I yeah. can't do anything about it. Right. So I actually went out of my way to never find out what happened. Okay. Never find out what happened. So you don't have to give any then commentary. What, I just, I just, not even, no one's going to ask me to comment. I just don't want to know. It doesn't involve me. Yeah. My life will not improve. It's just nothing's going to happen. So I just avoided it. And after a month, of course, it died down. And then two, three months later, I was speaking to a relative of the people involved in the scandal. Yeah. About something completely different. And then, so they brought it up using that technique, you know. They just brought it up. I was like, I don't know what happened there. They're like, no, come on. I'm like, I don't know what happened. I don't want to know what happened. I purposely stayed out of the way. And they were like, I mean, for them, they were it was they were shocked. Like, right, right. It was a really juicy one. Of course. You know? But I'm like, okay, what's it going to do for me? Yeah. So now, I guess the real question, though, is that you got these classes, you put together, and there's a lot of real value here. Ultimately, I think when when people take these courses, it's not the end. 
right? Yeah. What, 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 and, and cause there's this whole thing with like, okay, I learned something, I gotta apply everything. Yeah. Right? Versus I learned something, I'm not gonna apply anything at all. Mm -hmm. Right? But at the same time, it's like, okay, but then what's the next thing? How do I, uh, how, how do I grow? How do I develop? Yeah. Right? Like, it's kind of hard for me to articulate the. No, I got you. Okay. And you got to find it. So you got to do it right, right? Yeah. Because. Like I got to apply all of it. That's your, like your path to burnout. Right. <laughs> and then I'm not going to do anything. Then why are you here? <laughs> you know, this right, guy is never right. going to do anything with the material. Yeah. You just wasted a weekend, you know? And, um, uh, I mean, yeah, there's some prophetic guidelines on that issue, but, but it's doing what you can bear. It's revisiting the material again, because it's a lot of information. You got to come back to it again. Sure. Um, it's funny how sometimes like e even my own material, like in the da'wah class, this would happen. I, I'll teach so many different techniques. Yeah. And sometimes you just, for whatever reason, stick to one technique and use it a lot. Yeah. And then you go through your notes and I'm like, oh yeah, I used to, oh, that used to be my go-to technique. Right. I haven't used this in years. Yeah. And you go back to it. So I'm, wh what I'm trying to say is the instructor himself might not use a technique, let alone you not going back to your notes, reviewing them and saying, let me, let me apply this, let me learn this, let me change that. Yeah. Like that verse 58 example in Surah Al-Nur verse 58 if you teach your children that I'm not going to say what it is but you're going to be one of the oh, I can say yeah. it, you'll be one of the few people on the planet who does it what is verse 58 verse 58 is talking about right we got yeah. COVID when it comes to com whether it be seeking knowledge right whether it be uh, keeping your deen up because it's hard right people like you can't even go to the messages for the most part most yeah. places aren't even doing Jummah. We don't even know when this thing is going to end. Even if they were to come out with a vaccine today, yeah. we probably won't see it for months. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it's not even an epidemic. It's a pandemic. I just was hoping maybe you can kind of leave off with certain thoughts uh, or certain ideas. Because it could be depressing. It could, it's, it's spiritually, um, it, I mean, being at home mm -hmm. all the time, seeing the same people over and over, and the stresses of work and everything like that, that's taxing. Not having the, at least for me, like going, not being able to go to Juma. Yeah. Right? Like that's my, essentially, it's like a, a weekly refresher. It's an anchor to let me know the week is, this is the week. Man, it's, uh, it's. Um, well, let, let me ask you this. Yeah. Maybe, maybe more appropriately. Okay. How have you coped with this? I don't want to disappoint, you know, but this is one of my, well, I was going to say problems, but it's really not a problem. But yeah. I had this since when, since I was young. Yeah. And just nothing worries me or stresses me out. And okay. my, my mother would say, this guy, this guy, nothing bothers this guy, okay. you know? And like now, this COVID thing, people stuck at home. Without even knowing it, I just got this new hobby and I'm taking these bikes apart all day, you know? Right. Nothing gets me to to be down or depressed for days or what have you. I'm just, it's just not in my nature. I'm not saying I trained myself or anything. Right, right. It's just, I can't take credit for it. I, just, I feel like the gem here is to find something that brings you joy. Absolutely. And, and, and the ability to find joy in whatever scenario you're, you're in, you know, yeah. it, and it doesn't matter what the environment is. Um, not completely related, but when Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, when he was in jail, mm -hmm. so he didn't even feel it. During the time of the, the trial of Imam Ahmad, one of the scholars said, uh, he was jailed also, and they would put this big brick. It's like a common thing with these scholars. It's like you go to... <laughs> they, they, they figured it out, man. Right? They cracked the code. <laughs> so, he, and I think it was a Sheikh Al Adrami, right? And they had this huge brick that weighed something like 20 or 40 pounds okay. stuck between the chains. Oh, wow. And he, he, he wrote. It's like those cartoons where they have that kettlebell attached exactly. to the. Uh, okay. He said, Wallahi, there are times at night, and he's lying in his cell and it's dark and everything. When I cannot feel my chains or the brick at all to the point where I have to touch to check that they're still there. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, he was... So they couldn't imprison him. Like, it, it didn't matter the surrounding. Ibn Taymiyyah, though, but look, mm -hmm. sometimes you can tie it to your passion. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said, like, you know, when they jailed him, they said it's like he, it didn't matter if he's in a jail cell or his home. Because what is his passion? His writing. Mm -hmm. He was just writing all night and day. But then look what he said. It's beautiful. When they took his pen and his papers, he said, now jail started. Oh. See, like he was tied to his passion and nothing else mattered. And then when he took his, they took his pen and pen uh, and paper, he said, now this, the jail time starts today. Okay. So now they put him in jail. 
I don't know. I'm not pretending I've got the, right, the right, formula. Right, I'm just right, throwing right, stuff right. out there. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, and then the, there's another thing that makes it worse for me. Like I, there's one time I was in uh, the Caucasus region. Let me just say that. Okay. And I didn't leave home for three weeks. Okay. And I loved every second of it. So, so you traveled to a whole different part of the world and, and you I stayed did home. not leave. Well, I stayed there for three months total, but I got yeah. sick. It was a combination that made me not leave the home for okay. three weeks. Yeah. And I loved every split second of it. Okay. And that's why the quarantine thing, I was like, yeah, we're going to stay home and not leave. I love, hate leaving, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. You want to murder me? Hey, let's go to the mall after lunch and walk around. Okay. Like, oh. Okay. Okay. That, 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 that's, the, that's the introvert talking. That's the introvert, big time. Okay. okay. I could stay in that garage for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> that was, do you want to tell what you're hoping? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a kind of a really dumb thought, but initially when this thing it's came out, <laughs> I was like, so I'm, I'm enjoying being in the garage so much. Like sometimes it literally is there all day. He doesn't even have an AC. No, it's so hot. Yeah. It's Texas, it's Houston, it's so hot. I'm dying in there. And just to kind of give you guys an idea, it's like 60 plus percent humidity every day for like eight months out of the year. And especially during the summer months, we're easily hitting upper 90s to the hundreds. Oof. Yeah. During those hot times, yeah. I spent the entire day in the garage, okay? And it was hot and it was sticky, but I loved it. So in a weird way, maybe not completely consciously, but deep down, I kind of wanted to get sick. So that way I could close the door yeah. and just quarantine myself in the garage while I'm just working. Oh, I don't man. have to ever leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, khair, inshallah. <laughs> All right, Sheikh Ahmad, Jazakallah khair for joining. Barakallah uh, feek, man. For, for uh, spending this time with us. Uh, and, and we did kind of go a little bit long, but it's like, you know, a lot of people don't, I feel like people don't know. Like, I got the uh, the blessing of knowing you just through the years. Exactly. Khair. Right? And, and the feeling is mutual. Alhamdulillah. And, uh, and, but the thing is, we like because the times not only are they different today recently, but like even just the increase of digital media, social media, the way we interact with each other has also changed. And it's true. And I'm, I'm a kind of a recluse, and I also didn't get all into the whole taking pictures of my lunch and posting it for my followers. <laughs> and like, my life is better than yours, brothers. Here's my steak. What are you eating? Yes, hope you guys enjoyed. If you did enjoy, let us know in the comments below. Sheikh, if they want to find you, you're probably like I'm like, like, like don't, don't look for me <laughs> I was actually I was actually doing this show in the UK and yeah. it was like a show that had a lot a huge massive viewing and of course back then especially people were they didn't have Snapchat back then yeah. but people were trying to push their social media big time sure. and they were giving me this golden opportunity they're like um, how can people contact you they're asking me live on the air and yeah. I'm like I don't want anybody to contact me. Do not contact me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> they were so shocked too. It, it, it's funny. I was at the Al Maghrib uh, customer service uh, in uh, in the office in uh, in uh, Toronto, or rather in one of the suburbs. Uh, one of the common questions that they get in customer service: Oh, how do I get in touch with Sheikh So and So? Oh, right. I have a very important question to ask them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. I know about those so, questions. Actually, what you guys can do is if you do have a very important question to ask Sheikh Kamal, leave in the comments below. Next time I see you, maybe I'll gather those questions. We could just have like hey, a, why not? Yeah, just uh, yeah, rattle off a, a Q and A series. Yeah, absolutely. We're conversational, not talking to the camera yeah. and dying while doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, guys. If you enjoyed this, make sure you hit the subscribe button, join the notification squad by hitting that little bell icon. And that's it, guys. Assalamualaikum. Stay happy, stay in your garage. <laughs> <laughs>